there's lots of really cool things you can actually see from space, including your house, <laughs> using Google Maps. Did you know that most of the images on Google are actually taken from aircraft and not from satellites? This is a flight plan of a Google aircraft to get the real detail of your street. So what exactly can we see from space? And where does space begin? About 100 miles up. A lot of weird stuff is visible from space. And here's a selection. But this film's not about Google Earth. This film is about strange signals that have been sent by humans that can only be seen from space. In the 1980s, we had SALT, Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, where both sides, the United States and the Soviet Union, wanted to limit the number of nuclear weapons on our planet. So they both agreed that they would destroy some of their nuclear weapons. But how could this be verified by the other side? So verification was really important. The United States had a lot of bombers, mainly B-52s. So this is what they did. They parked them in the desert, visible from space, and chopped them up separating the wings and the fuselage. This meant the Soviet Union could count the number of American bombers that had been destroyed. The former USSR did something very strange. They decided to launch their intercontinental ballistic missiles and crash them into the ocean. This, of course, was potentially really dangerous because it might have triggered an alert from Space Command deep under the hills of Colorado. But no. How they did it was they told the Americans they were going to launch one of their missiles and crash it into the sea. And the USA monitored it from an aircraft. During one of these destruction missions, an American aircraft launched out of the Aleutian Islands quite near Alaska spotted something really weird. While monitoring the missile, the Americans saw a strange dome of light. And this is a transcript of the pilot who saw the strange occurrence. Roger Hopkins, the pilot aboard RC-135S, said Sometime during late 1988, most likely October or November, my crew from the 24th Strategic Reconnaissance Squadron, 6th Strategic Wing of Allison Air Force Base, Alaska, was at Shemya Air Force Base, Alaska for a routine two-week deployment during a sortie in the sensitive area east of the Kamchatka Peninsula near the USSR, we were notified that the Soviets had launched an SS-20 Sabre missile towards the Kura test range. This was part of the shoot to destruction provision of the 1987 treaty between the US and the Soviet Union. It called for the destruction of 72 of the 650 Soviet intermediate range ballistic missiles by launching them from a known test facility at a known impact site with unimpeded observation by national technical means. In this case, I was flying the national technical means. It was an RC-135S Cobra. Using a variety of optical and telemetry sensors, the RC-135S collected measurements and signature intelligence to verify compliance with the international arms agreements and to assess the maturity and development of foreign ballistic missile systems. 
as her crew prepared for the re-entry of the SS-23 re-entry vehicles. We climbed to our prescribed collection altitude and began timing track to ensure that the right side of the airplane, where all the sensors were located, was pointed towards the re-entry event. The autopilot was connected and the stellar inertial Doppler system for precise positioning within six feet of the airplane was used to confirm our presence in international airspace well beyond the Soviet territorial limit of 12 nautical miles. The stars were out that night and I don't recall any moonlight so we anticipated a nice light show from the RVs as they re-entered the atmosphere. As with any take or collection there was a general buzz of excitement as the back-end crew verified their sensors and recorders were fully operational. The other pilot and I looked out ahead and to the left to clear for any potential conflicting traffic. We flew using the International Civil Aviation Organization IACO due regard procedures where the pilots were responsible for the safety of our aircraft and others it might encounter. As we waited for the re-entry and looked for other traffic, we noticed what appeared to be a translucent, milky white wall moving from the left of the USSR to the right towards the northern Pacific Ocean. It covered the entire sky from ground up to as far as we could see. It moved very quickly, far faster than crossing other aircraft traffic, and it rapidly was approaching us. The wall of light passed across the flight path and then continued eastwards, leaving the empty and dark sky in its wake. Our program time turn arrived and we began to bank to the left to collect the RV data. Once we rolled out southbound, the wall of light was no longer visible. After the mission, the other pilot and I discussed what we had seen. We were convinced it wasn't a hallucination, but it was something that we had never seen before. Amazingly, I saw the same phenomenon at another SS-20 launch. What we saw became known as the Dome of Light. The US government responded. Jesse Helms, the North Carolina Senator said, hidden SS-20s could be used for a surprise party. Surprise party means a first strike. He went on to say, I worry that this weapon is a sea change and might make the treaty dead on arrival. What exactly it was, nobody really knows, but it was taken very seriously. And a wonderful Patreon supporter sent me this story. It has to be one of the best things that man has ever done to communicate with space. A Soviet soldier working in a remote missile base was actually spying for the USA. And he came up with this amazing way to communicate with the Americans. Every morning at a set time, he would lie down in the snow and do exercises, moving his arms and legs, a bit like making a snow angel. His colleagues thought he was mad, but left him alone to his exercises. What they didn't know, but he knew, is an American spy satellite was passing overhead at a set time every day and could see him on the ground. The shapes he made with his arms and his legs during his exercise routine was a secret code to communicate with the Americans. As you all know, we live here in France and France invented lots of things, but one of the most amazing is the semaphore system. By moving the arms on two paddles, you could communicate between semaphore towers, literally at the speed of light. But of course it took time for the next tower to pass on the message. France set up the system to communicate between the major cities, 
Paris to Lyon to Nice and to Bordeaux near where we live. And thanks very much to Tom Scott, his wonderful channel. Tell me about this story, the Bordeaux Stock Exchange scam using semaphore. The main stock market in France is in Paris, but if you knew how it was moving, you could buy stocks and shares in an office in Bordeaux. So if you knew how the stock market had changed in Paris, you had a few minutes to buy and sell shares in Bordeaux to make lots of money. If only you could tell how things had changed in Paris. Interesting side note, France never trusted the telegraph. They thought that it could be compromised by people cutting the line. So the government controlled secure semaphore system was adopted, but it was absolutely not public. You could not send a private message. It was for government officials and military officials only. But these two characters in Bordeaux bribed one of the arm moving operators to send them a secret message. But it was all in code. And I recently figured out how exactly they did it. Between Paris and Bordeaux, there was a special check tower where messages that were coming down were decoded and checked that they were making sense because it was easy to make errors in the system. According to this document that I've just had translated by a wonderful French friend, how they did it is that they sent colored gloves as a code to this bribed person in the halfway tower who would then send them the message. A packet of gloves, quite innocent in France at the time, would arrive at the halfway tower. The operator would open it and see red, 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 green, purple, yellow, and blue, and send that code to Bordeaux. The guys in Bordeaux had a semaphore handbook and looking at the nearest station to them, they picked up when the arms moved the code from Paris using the colored gloves. No doubt the officials in Bordeaux said, what message is this? But by then it was too late. The Bordeaux stock market scammers supposedly made a fortune until their scheme was rumbled. There was a system to look for erroneous messages and eventually the person who was bribed came clean. But as a great twist to end the story, they were never charged because at the time there wasn't an offence of sending an illegal message using optical or electronic means and they had to change the law. They got away with it completely and kept the money thanks to French semaphore. So even back in the 18th century, there was people trying to steal your electronic mail or corrupt your messages. That's why today, more than ever, you need a decent VPN. And I really recommend you try NordVPN. And I can offer you an amazing discount off NordVPN. Use the code Prof Simon, you'll see the link in the description below. Sign up today and protect your semaphore messages.